Hi folks, welcome back. Tonight we're continuing on making the uh, the parts for the Kingway measuring device. Uh, last week I showed you how I made these pieces here. Richard gave this to me about seven, eight years ago. And just now getting around to need it because I haven't needed it for a while. Around here things get done on an as-needed basis. I don't make any money at this, so I have to kind of watch what I do. And that's part of tonight's video, is using tools that you have to do a machining process that you need to do. Now this part uh, basically holds up a metal rod going this direction, and it also holds a rod going down. Now the rods that I bought for this were precision shafts, stainless steel, and they were supposed to be precision shafts. Well, unfortunately, this one is a thousandths undersize. So that changed everything about how I was going to bore and attach a stainless, well, it's not stainless, these are chrome steel. Through the video that you're going to watch, I keep referring to them as stainless. I didn't know until about five minutes ago that they are actually chrome, not hardened stainless balls, uh, chrome steel. These are even harder than hardened stainless steel balls. I found a chart after us having so much problems trying to take very precise cuts in this ball of different ball materials and right up here the hardest ball materials are these tungsten carbide balls they're up to about 90 uh, the chrome steel is 60 to 67 hardened stainless steel is 58 to 65 and then mild steel stainless is uh, only about 28 anyway we're dealing with this chrome steel and it can be drilled by EMD and modified by grinding. Well, everything else up here is easily drilled and machined. Well, it's not easy, but I did it, dang it. it took a while to figure out exactly what I needed to do and I only have two chances because that's all the balls I have, two. That's all I need. Anyway, this is what I ended up with. This is the rod that this rides on different surfaces as you're measuring things. Now, I wanted this ball to be perfect on this rod. Then the only time it matters is if I'm measuring an inverted V way. Instead of on a verb V way, instead of this ball point touching it's these two sides that'll touch so I wanted it to be perfectly aligned with this shaft so that as it's going down a v-rail it's not going off like this because this is cattywampus in order to make it as perfect as I could I changed my mind on how to attach this ball originally I was going to thread the rod thread the inside of this ball and then screw it on. Then I got to thinking how hard this ball was and how hard it was going to be to make a precision inside thread on this and this wasn't a big problem but in here it would be. It was a big unknown until I cut one open. So I decided to precision bore a hole a thousandths undersize for this shaft and press it into place using a, a 640 Loctite sleeve retaining compound that I've used before. You're going to have to get this off with heat and a sledgehammer. So that's finished. What will happen now is this part here will ride along your bed or your V-way or whatever you want. This will slide down over it and clamp with a nut. Another shaft will go in here and come across 
to where there'll be a matching one of these with the exception of this part here which is precision ground will have a shaft on it that screws into here and this will be the second part. This in actuality turns into a three-point system. This point here, these points, and this ball. Now, this one is ground so that it can ride on a corner of something and be used on the inside. Or you can turn it up and run it on the outside like this. It has three different threading uh, hole positions so that you can thread this, this rod into it. Well, the rod's made, I just got to thread it to that thread. I think it's a 5 16 18 thread. No big deal. This was the one that I wanted to be really super precision. This one has two points that will keep it aligned as it's going down, whereas this is only has this one point. But if you put it into a V, inverted V rail, it'll have a point here and a here. So this isn't as critical as this. Richard gave this to me many years ago, and I just haven't had time to put this all together. But now I need it, so that's what we're doing. I bought these studs when I bought the vials. Now, people have made the comment that I should just buy a couple of sterrets, take their vials and use them. I've got sterrets. Uh, lays that I could have robbed. I hate doing that. I'm going to make this thing and I don't want to have to be going back and forth. So yes they were expensive but now I've got a precision instrument. These, well the vials came from uh, Gear, G-E-I-E-R dash Bloom, B-L-U-H-M dot com. Now, the vials that I bought are more expensive than any and have a better resolution than any I see on their website now. So, don't know what to tell you about that. These are mounting posts that you put the vial on. You use this thread on the end to thread it into a plate. If you go to their website, they have a link here to the drawing which is available for this. You click on that and it says page not found. I have no idea what that thread is on the end. You say, well, that's what thread checkers are made for. I've got one. A huge one. All metric, all everything. None of those fit this thread. It looks to be somewhere in the quarter by maybe 32. There's a lot of different threads that aren't on these things. And unfortunately, I don't want to go buy two or three caps and get the wrong one, because I'll never use it again. So I sent an email and nobody's replied in two weeks, so now I'm going to call them. But that's what will hold that up. I need to know what that is. The balls, like I say, they're, they're finished. I got a haircut today at 3 o'clock, so the rest of the video is going to show me wild man style. Thanks for watching. The next video after this one is going to be making a plate that's got an inch and a quarter radius in it. On one side, it'll be round, an inch and a half outer diameter, about three-eighths of an inch thick, and then ground flat on the back. So that when you put this in that little sled, it slides along a lot better and you don't wear a hole on the end of your ball. That sounds painful. Anyway, the 20-inch axle sends up for that. That'll be the next video. Enjoy this one. I do a lot of talking because mainly I'm trying to teach people that don't know what the heck I'm talking about how they could do some of this stuff. And anybody can make chips. It's how to make the right kind of chips 
and make precision holes and stuff and hard things and I do a terrible job on it by the way but it worked have fun today I'm going to continue on working on the Kingway device now I made a little short the last video was getting to be two hours long and so I didn't cut out boring the second part of this cross piece here. Let me get one. Now, this is the same thing as chucked up in here right now. I bored both holes through. Now I've got to learn, uh, not learn, I know how. Slit these and bore them and put the thumb screws in so we can clamp it onto these rods that go through. Now, I made a short, which can only be 60 seconds or less, which is damn near impossible for me. Showing how I aligned this. For those of you that missed it, I'm just going to go a real quick. I had a few comments on how other people would do it. In machining, there's lots of ways to do stuff depending on what kind of equipment you got, how accurate you want it to be, all kinds of things. That's why I like machining. You got to use your head sometimes and figure out ways to make things work. And, and believe me, this, this king way, I don't have a lot of the tools ready to go to make this thing, so I'm having to find alternative ways. And frankly, one guy said they had put it on a rotary table in Millie's. These things are made for going in a three-jaw chuck. See how they got a one, two, and three, or three over here. One, two, and three. It fits perfect in a three-jaw chuck. Why would you want to sit there trying to indicate it on a, a rotary table? Anyway, this is the way I chose to do it. Works fine. This is set up here, and I was imagining that I hadn't bored this hole yet. The way I set this up was I put it in here, then I took one of the shafts and inserted it in here. Then took an indicator and got this part right here indicated so it's perfect coming this way. And then I took, and this is what some people didn't understand, I took a rule. Because I don't have much room here, I've got a, uh, an indicator sitting up here. I see. Just don't be a part of the demonstration. See if I care. You know, the time you get an indicator on one of these, and you're sitting here trying to, that's all the space I've got to indicate. The time you're sitting there getting everything lined up, putting down parts that to try to escape on you. It's hard because you got to do two things at one time. So I got out a trusty scale and I scaled off of the face of this three jaw chuck which was holding it and eyeballed the dimensions on both sides mainly because I could do it quick and I could see both sides as I'm adjusting. And then along with this, going back and forth on that, I lined it up. Now, there's 64 little bitty indications on this scale. Using the old Mark I eyeballs with a, an accessory cheater here, I can get pretty damn close. I've been doing this for... What are you going to do? 
Anyway, I've been doing this for minimum of 55 years. I'm balling things. You can do it well. I don't need to get an indicator, which is really friggin' hard to get in here, and then try another indicator to get that all done. I don't need that. So, this worked well enough. And in fact, it doesn't have to be perfect on this scale. All these things do is hold up a post. It's going to be this post if it may not if it doesn't start cooperating. This goes here to hold it up off of your, your whatever you're measuring. Then another piece goes here, and then another one goes down. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. What does have to be perfect is how this ball attaches to the end of it. And the only time it really needs to be perfect is if I'm measuring a V-way, an inverted V-way. Because as this is sliding down the V-way, if this isn't the same and it's off a little bit, it throws the measurements off. So that's important. 90 degrees to each other, not so much. This has proved to be a problem. Those are reamed holes, as you can see from the last video. This is a piece of stainless steel precision shafting. But they missed their mark when they ground this. It's a thousandths undersize. Which, for this it doesn't matter because we're going to tighten it up. But where it comes into play is my reamer that I was using, and I bought a brand new one. I've got two now. I'm going to bore a hole in this, and I was going to ream it, because it would be an exact size to this. Now this is a thousandths too short, or the diameter is a thousandths under. So if I ream this, it'll be a thousandths loose in here, and I don't want that. So now I'm going to have to bore this and measure it precisely to get a press fit. Because I'm going to press this on into that hole. So what you'll see is that when I'm through. I'm going to press that in and use some uh, Loctite sleeve retainer that works real good. That's all that's needed. I thought about just going and threading it and then threading this, and I thought, well, that introduces a little bit of different wonkiness. I don't need wonkiness when I'm trying to make this perfect. But if I make this a press fit with this rod, I'm sure I can do a better job of making it concentric with the ball. Now, I was going to go really super. I would press fit this on and then return this ball. But I think it'll be good enough and we'll measure it after we're through and see what kind of run out we get. Might have to do something different. Away it goes. So anyway, that's that. Another part I'm going to start working on is if you see this little plastic cap, this is an analog for what I've got to make as another part of the Kingway. Only I'm going to make mine an inch and a half in diameter. This is one and a quarter inch diameter ball. So I need something. And the reason you do this is you can put this down flat on a flat surface and your ball in here. And because this will be able to turn like that, it doesn't affect the measurements. And you can slide along here. Whereas, if you just use the ball, you could wear a flat spot on at the bottom of it over time, and you don't need flat spots on your balls. It's unnatural. So anyway, that's what we're going to do next. But, as usual, I'm going to have to use another machine to do so. Bob can't do that. So we're going to use that southern machine. You'll like it. It's a nice big 20-inch axle. So 
So let me get this set up. We've got to change some things around here. Biggest thing we've got to change is this chuck. To put this ball on this machine the way I want to, to get it the most perfect alignment. This would work, but it could be off a little bit. I can't do it. A collet's much better. In one of the other videos, you saw me putting a relief on the inside or a little chamfer down in here. Use the tool grinder and a Dremel to, to take care of a little more relief so that this ball would fit in and get past the major diameter of the ball. So when this squeezes down, it holds it tight. That was pretty easy. But now this needs to go on the machine. One of the good things about Bob is that it has very good bearings up here. And they're not in an oil bath. They're, you never have to oil them. And it's got a stop right here that I can lock the, the spindle to be able to change tools. I think it's this way. Yep. For those of you new guys, even you old guys that don't do this, a little board can save your ways. See, now don't dent up things. I don't know if you ever, some of you know it, but this is Bob's collet drawer. Got racks for different collets that I use. And it's got shells and all kinds of stuff in there. But it sure is nice to keep your vices. I got a four jaw in here. And that's what's that up. Still kind of recovering from being so sick with the COVID. It's taken. Well, you're looking at the. Oh, come on. Pay attention. Keep up with me. Come on, you guys. Keep up. I've been sitting over here cleaning off this spindle. Get a rag. As I was saying, I've been recovering from COVID. Five weeks since I got it. Still weak as a kitten. Doctors kept me on the Nanu Manjaro diabetic medicine. And my blood sugar and everything's come down to really normal levels. I'm now off all of the diabetic type 2 medications. And uh, it's kind of nice. In fact, went to the doctor this week and she took me off four different medications. Uh, my cholesterol and everything has gone down to normal levels. So she's four different pills I don't have to take anymore. Just one shot every week. But those things are so small needle you don't even feel them. And as a side benefit, I've lost 30 pounds so far. Now, whether that was all from the... <laughs> This medicine or being sick with COVID for so long, I don't know. Now this is this is a 5C collet. And it has a standard nose down here, the taper on it. But this one also gets much bigger than what a regular 5C collet can do. 
but you got to do a little bit more. Still use the same locking pin and getting it in place. And over here on the other side of Bob, this in place. said there it goes. There it goes. All I'm doing is twisting the end of this caudal closer over here. Now it's threaded lined up. When I get this tight, just using the collet closer, It's good, but it's not the whole. Uh, you don't do this every day, you forget things. This is another part of Bob that you install like this and it then allows you, when you're pulling it in, to use this taper into this nose, and that helps close that better. Put this on. Then this. I want to clean that too. Be back, got to get the phone. No, I don't. Spam risk. Now I got it ready to start tightening it down. The old inch and a quarter precision ball. Hold that in there. Basically this, I'm over here on this side here, pulls tension over here. See how that's right there? And then you push it and it clicks in place. Now to make this turn you have to have this little tab indexed into the spine. Put it there and see if I can see that closed it good and put some tension on it. So I'm going to lock this down. There should hold my, my ball. Don and I were talking the other day, and Don made the comment, Oh, I like to see the chips flying. And apparently, a lot of you guys do too. I mean, I understand that. The problem is, everything I've done up to now has to be done before the chips even fly. The chips flying is the simplest part of the whole operation. You got to figure out how you're going to hold it, which machine to use, what you're going to do, which tooling to use, and that's all a big part of machining. If you don't get this right, you can't make chips right. So I'm sorry if it takes me long, but I want you guys to see how I do things, and it's not always the right way, but believe me. But it's a way that works for me. And 
I learn all kinds of things by watching how people do things. The chips, they're just something that I look at as the after product. It's something I got to put in the trash or drag into my wife's nice clean house on the bottom of my shoes. So I'll try to make you some chips, but please think of it this way. This is the important part. All right. We now have our ball held securely. That's where all balls should be. Now the problem with holding the ball securely on Bob is I need to really know where this tooling is in the center. Okay, we've got a stop back there, and this is lined up on the stop, but believe me, I don't even know if it's for sure on that stop. So I need to do something right now to make sure that my tool holder is still on center with this collet. Now if it was another collet, I'd be happy, but because I took the three jaw off, I need to line that back up. But it's not a big deal. The reason it's not a big deal is because in the last video we made some alignment tools. These little rods. That right there should be lined up and Just need to double check it. So I'm gonna get a collet out that fits this rod on one end. I'll show you what I'm looking at. They make collets in all shapes and sizes. Here's square, six-sided, all the way up to the different sizes. Tiny ones, big ones, little ones. Now these all look dirty and bad. But the reason they look that way is because Bob uses oil for coolant and it kind of puts a nice little oil finish on everything and I just leave it because where's my 5 8 Bit me. I love my little paper towel dispenser. Get a clean rag every time they're cheap. I'm going to take my little nose off because I don't need to. A little bitty tiny bit off. In other words, it was a good thing to check it. I can tell it's off because when I'm coming in, I feel a little bit of resistance and then it starts. So that should go in there with no resistance at all. So what I've got to do is move this tool holder over. Put 
Now everything's set up on Bob to be the up and down centers are the same. Let's make sure we've got Bob turned over to the stop. The stop, it goes in nicely. That's perfectly lined up. Because that one was off, I'm going to run around here and, and my center drill. Needs to be checked. It's on perfect. Good. Now the part Don's been waiting for, making chips. Everything's set. Ball's being held by a collet in place. I'm going to face off a flat spot on this. And the reason is it's hard to start a hole on a spherical surface. If you flat it, no problem at all. So we're going to make a flat on here. Roughly the same size as this is. 5 eighths of an inch. It doesn't have to be perfect. So we're going to start it drill, start drill, drill, and then bore it to size. Got to interrupt here guys, got some bad news. I took a lot of footage of close-up pictures with a little, uh, little camera you see sometimes on the carousel. The cart got corrupted, I lost all of it. So from here on out, I'm going to dig through and show you the chip cutting as much as I can. Uh, some parts of it, it might help to think of this as more of a radio show than a video show. There's a lot of places that you're going to be able to truly enjoy the back of my shirt. I'm going to try to cut out most of that and I'm going to be skipping around. Now, well, i got a few more things I might as well tell you while I got you here. This ball was incredibly hard, and it's really good that I decided to, to ream this out and press fit it. Threading would have been a nightmare. The mill bit, as you'll see, that I had to end up drilling with worked very well because I could take a deep cut. It had four flutes on it, so it was kind of spaced out. It was pushing into the material and trying to go against the side of a material which would cause flex in a single pointed tool. Anyway, all that worked against me. Uh, Bob did good. Uh, I ended up running it at the very end at about 3000 RPMs. Now, stainless steel in those ranges runs about 3,400 RPMs, depth of cut of about uh, 0.40, and a feed rate of uh, 4 thousandths per revolution. I didn't have that kind of depth of cut to do this with. I was only taking mainly about 25 thousandths off as we were getting close. So it went slow, it was hard. Uh, in the end, it worked pretty well, but I was having to hunt around trying to find something to reduce the rubbing and the chatter and all the other things that were going on. So, you might want to hold your ears sometimes. I'll, I'll try to warn you. This was for you, Don. Lock it in place. Start up the old machine. Can you all see?
Don says he couldn't ever see the, the tool cutting. I don't know why. We're riding right there. I don't know how hard this ball is. Now the question is, after I've destroyed that, will this center drill, y'all aren't even looking, work or not? I believe the answer is hell no. So, what do we do now, sports fans? Going to have to switch to a carbide bit. I don't know if I have a half inch handy. No, you go back to what do you have that will work. Well, I don't have a half inch carbide drill. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a carbide mill bit in the end that's a center cutting. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's got a half inch base on it. And we'll see if this will stand up to that metal. I suspect the outside's hardened, but I expect the inside to be not hardened. So if I can get through all of this, we may be in good shape. to increase the speed a little bit. We'll see. Right, I'm looking again. Likes that. Now that mill bit is a 2964. 2964, you say. That's 0.4531. What I need to be at is six. 0.6249. So I got plenty of room to bore. 
If I could get this to easily take out the center, I'd have a nice hole to start from boring. So, let's continue. Work so good about three hundred thousands in. in. I like. The trim tap heavy is probably half of the equation here. deep enough. The nice part about using this is gives you a nice flat hole at the bottom. Five hundred and forty-two thousandths, that's a half inch over a like. First you don't succeed, try again. That worked well. Well, I dug around. I found a boring bar. It's carbide tipped. It'll fit right in there, and hopefully, I don't have to move it out of position, but I might have to. We'll see. All those tools have flats on them so that as you tighten it down it brings that up to the correct level. The question is do I have enough clearance for that to get in all the way around and I believe I do. So let's see what happens.
cuts it, it's hot. Put Bob in the gear. Let's see what it does as it's going in there. It may be too much. But Bob doesn't like to slow down. That drive down there is electrical. And I got it at about 25 now. Here come some chips, Bob. Don. But, because I don't know what kind of chips are going to be. Cut it. Doesn't like it at that speed, so. Move it up some more. Let's see what it does by hand. You hear all that noise? That's rubbing. It's not cutting. that right I'm just going to work harden it and I'm going to bust that boring tip the carbide likes fast I wonder what it would do if I slow this down No, as I gave it more pressure in the feed, it calmed down and started cutting big chips. So what I'm going to do next, is increase the RPMs. Been running in two, it was up to 1250. Now I'm going to speed three. Let's go to about 1600 and see. Get out of the way of the shower of blue.
Now the bad thing that just happened was it heated up the workpiece. When you're trying to get to these dimensions, you're going to have to let that cool off before you can measure it again. But, it should be about 15 thousandths away. So let's see, just for the fun of it, see if that's about where we are. can tell it's cutting a taper. It goes in a little bit and then it tapers. So the only way to get a true reading on that is to bore it some more. Straighten that taper out. But a 605 goes in quite a ways. Just for the heck of it, we're going down to 1500. Well, this certainly wasn't pretty. The big deal was, even though I'm pumping it out at 3,000 at the end, and I got a super sharp bit to get it in there without rubbing, it was starting to cut, but some hard stuff. This is a 324, and it starts in this far. And then it stops, and then we'll press it in the rest of the way. No, this is a 223, excuse me. So... It's going to be a nice press fit. Thanks for watching. Sorry it took so long. Bye.